Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning if you're on the West Coast. Uh, I'm Ted Seaslack. I'm a pediatrician and infectious disease physician, and I run the quarantine unit here at the University of Nebraska's Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. And I will be your host today uh, for our webinar concerning the ethical issues in pandemic response. So before we go any further, I want to say a few words about my favorite subject, me. Uh, so from 2001 to 2006, I was the chairman of the pediatrics department uh, in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, my deputy was a trained medical ethicist, Tom Jefferson. He had served as the uh, ethics editor for JAMA. And uh, he came and brought me, I guess he thought I needed some ethical grounding. He brought me uh, a textbook about medical ethics, still brand new, wrapped in cellophane. Um, and I didn't have the heart to tell him that I already had a copy of that book. So I set it on my bookshelf and I left it there uh, for the entire five and a half years that I served in that position, still wrapped in cellophane. And every time Tom would come into my office, um, I think that was a source of great disappointment for him. So you can obviously see why uh, the powers that be don't want me personally talking about ethics. And so we brought in uh, some real experts in the field. So uh, I'll give a few uh, boilerplate remarks and then Abby Lowe and Matt Winia will talk about uh, the COVID-19 Ethics Advisory Committee. Then Matt and Kathy Kinlaw will talk about crisis standards of care. Then we'll move into emerging issues in medical ethics. And then I'll close uh, by talking about some of our NETEC resources. And time permitting, uh, we'll take your questions and answers. I would point out that at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A tab. Uh, you'll notice there's also a chat tab. Uh, but I would uh, recommend that you submit your questions to the Q&A tab, and we will try to answer each of those. If time permits, we'll answer some of them during this broadcast, and if we don't get to all of them, uh, we'll uh, formulate a question and answer sheet, and we'll post it to the NETEC website uh, sometime shortly after this broadcast. So let me just say a little bit about NETEC itself. NETEC is the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. Uh, we grew out of uh, our response to uh, Ebola during the West African outbreak of 2014-2016, and NETEC started out as a triumvirate of institutions, Nebraska, uh, Emory, and New York Health and Hospitals Bellevue's Medical Center. Um, and we took care of a few uh, Ebola patients at those three institutions during that outbreak, and we're proud of our ability to do that, but I think the real benefit of NETEC lies in what has come since then, in the establishment of a nationwide system uh, that we feel has increased greatly the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems uh, to manage folks infected with some of these highly hazardous uh, communicable diseases. So NETEC, in addition to providing educational offerings such as the webinar you're focused in on today, uh, also provides a wide variety of other assistance. Uh, we can send teams out uh, on site to your facility to do an assessment. These are non-punitive uh, assessments. We come out and help you improve uh, your processes, help you develop metrics. Uh, we've got educational offerings that go beyond these webinars, both online and in person. Uh, we have uh, technical assistance teams, uh, repositories, uh, exercise templates, and other guidance. And then finally, we're establishing a research network that will include an online repository for research protocols, as well as ultimately a specimen biorepository. And with that said, I've spent enough of your time talking. I will turn it over to the real experts, Abby Lowe and Matt Winian. Thanks, Ted. Um, real quick, my name is Abby Lowe. I am the Director of Ethics and um, Public Health Preparedness at the Center for Preparedness Education at Un the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, and I'll just go ahead and, and pass it over to my co-presenters so that they can give themselves their own introduction. You can start with Matt. Thanks, Abby. Um, this is Matt Winia. I'm uh, the Director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado. My Training is in infectious diseases and public health, as well as bioethics. And I've been involved in the uh, thinking and, and writing and policymaking around crisis standards of care um, 
since the 2009 uh, Institute of Medicine report on this. And I've been very involved recently with our Colorado uh, state level work. Um, and recently actually uh, published a piece in the Annals of Internal Medicine along with the Association of Bioethics Program Directors looking at all of the um, policies on crisis standards of care that we could find around the country, sort of comparing where there are areas of similarities and differences. And hi, this is Kathy Kinlaw. I'm the Associate Director for the Center for Ethics at Emory University, and also heavily involved in on-the-ground efforts with Emory Healthcare, where I serve as the lead clinical ethicist. Um, I have uh, sort of a history of working in this arena of pandemic planning, uh, having worked with CDC on their National Ethics uh, Subcommittee and looking at pandemic influenza and working on some of the um, publications with CDC then, and then have um, in the last six weeks or so been heavily involved in uh, both creating guidance related to allocation, not only for Emory Healthcare, but also with hospitals in our region through a group we have called the Healthcare Ethics Consortium. So very excited to be with you all and um, have a conversation today. Thanks, Kathy. Um, we'll go ahead, next slide. Um, the first thing we wanted to bring your attention to today um, is, is the um, Ethics Advisory Committee, the COVID Ethics Advisory Committee here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I just wanna draw your attention to the quote up in the right hand um, corner of that lovely artwork done by Nathan Gray. So around the country, hospitals are either feeling the opening barrage of a horrifying pandemic or rapidly scrambling to prepare for an onslaught in their own backyard. Every possible niche of healthcare is bracing for the likelihood of the deluge to come. And I'll, I'll just start with that because um, I think it kind of prefaces what we're going to be talking about today. And while maybe we're not all um, kind of bracing for that deluge, we are thinking about how we're pivoting towards reopening and what that might mean. So um, even as we've all kind of in our own pockets of the country thought about how we handle crisis standard of care planning, um, now we're moving into a different space and it requires different kinds of, uh, of guidance and thinking. And, um, and ethicists across the country have been generating such great content in real time trying to address the needs that we have um, in, in how, we, how we approach these really human um, issues that ethics brings up um, through resources on online content, through webinars like the one you're on today, publishing guidance like um, Matt and Kathy both referenced in their opening, really working to, to um, support this critical space of ethics. Um, and so one need we saw um, was to stand up a committee of experts that were prepared to take requests and provide real-time guidance to individuals in need. And so I think as, as this pandemic has moved and continues to shift and change, this need for real-time guidance is something that this Ethics Advisory Committee can is attempting to support. Next slide, slide please. So how, do, how does one get in touch? How does one request that kind of guidance? We recently opened up the Ethics Advisory Committee um, broadly in order to um, support requests from anyone who might need one. So uh, in follow-up to this uh, webinar and also maybe even in the chat, we'll go ahead and provide the link to the um, Ethics Advisory Committee website. Um, the committee really has been focused on issues related to clinical ethics, public health ethics, obviously crisis standards of care has been um, something that's very for, up in the forefront of our conversations. Um, and, but I want to kind of stress that the, that the committee is advisory in nature. Um, we definitely are invested in, in providing that kind of real-time feedback. We meet weekly to discuss um, issues that come um, to our group, but we also have um, set up a process for rapid review for those issues that may need more of a timely response and are prepared to, to do so in a 24-hour kind of turnaround time. So who are we and, and what exactly are, are we doing? Um, we're here to support um, broadly. And I think uh, 
Um, the composition of the committee um, is something that we were th very thoughtful about. There is, of course, a re really strong backbone in public health emergency ethics and disaster ethics because that's really um, informing how, how we can kind of go at the other areas that the committee has represented on it. Every, everything from um, clinical ethics, um, palliative care has obviously been something that is, we've grappled with, academic leadership, um, and, and I want to also say that the committee is comprised of individuals from across the country, Wisconsin, Maryland, Colorado, Montana, Minnesota, California, the, Virginia, and then we also have international representation from Singapore kind of help us think about how the outbreak exists in other parts of the world. Um, so the, the committee recognizes the speed um, that, that the change in the pandemic has taken on in the course. Of, of preparing for next stages. And so the complexity of issues, um, we definitely feel necessitate that kind of real-time guidance. Um, and so the committee's purpose is really to support, support in that space. So what kind of, of topics have we covered? Um, and here I'll kind of bring Matt Winia, who's actually the chair of the committee into the conversation. Um, we've seen a range of different topics definitely, as I said before, have covered that triage decision-making, end-of-life and palliative care in, in pandemic settings, but definitely touched as well on health disparity and public health ethics response, um, thinking about issues of fairness, um, thinking about worker, worker rights and fairness in spaces where um, we have critical infrastructure still operating, um, in, in places like meat processing plants, and how ought we, um, what do we owe that population of people as a society? Um, so really grappling with some of those issues. And I'll go ahead and, and pivot to Matt and see if, if he'd like to add anything. Yeah, thanks, Abby. I, th I think the one thing I would add is the, um, the really interesting questions we've gotten from, um, from all, all around the world, really. So um, the the, the ethics issues that are listed here are a, are a partial list of the topics that have been brought to us from a variety of places. And it's, uh, it's just been fascinating because I think um, there's been a little bit of a dearth of national level capacity for looking at ethical issues in this pandemic and providing some level of guidance. Uh, many of you will probably know that um, for many years there was a President's Commission on Bioethics or a President's Council on Bioethics. So there has been a national level um, sort of forum for deliberation on ethical issues that are transdisciplinary, that don't just touch the medical profession, for example where there are obviously national organizations like the American Medical Association that bring together multiple specialties. But these are the types of issues that actually extend beyond just the medical profession. And so there really, uh, I think, is a need for a transdisciplinary group that can look at national issues. And we've gotten questions and issues brought to us from California and from Singapore and from Nebraska and sort of from all over. And I think that's an illustration of the, of the, the, the sort of niche that this um, that this unique group can can serve. So this is a perfect seg to segue to the crisis standards of care conversation. So I'll let you take it from there, Matt. Great. Okay. Let's uh, let's go to the next slide. So. Um, Many of you are probably very familiar with this, um, so we'll go through the basics of the crisis standards of care framework um, pretty quickly. Um, crisis standards of care evolved out of earlier conversations post 9-11 around altered standards of care and our concerns about the possibility of not just a pandemic, but concerns um, that natural disasters can leave um, local, local locations so short of um, services compared to demand that there may come a time, even in the U.S., which is quite well resourced, broadly speaking, there may come a time and a place where people are unable to provide normal quality of care 
because the demand so outstrips the supply. So um, when the Institute of Medicine started looking at this in the late 2000s, um, really 2009, the so-called letter report on crisis standards of care was kind of a turning point and it, it arose out of concerns that we were about to experience an enormously devastating pandemic. Um, so for those of you who don't have this history, um, early in 2009, there were obvious cases of a brand new strain of flu to which no one had any immunity. Um, this uh, went away over the summer, but it left us all in the infectious disease and public health community and the disaster preparedness community thinking when flu season comes back around in the fall, we are going to be slammed. Um, and, and in fact, by the way, we were slammed. More than 60 million Americans caught pandemic flu in 2009 and 2010. We got very lucky because as it turned out, that pandemic flu was about as deadly as a common cold. So only about 12,000 people ended up dying from it. Uh, but 60 million people caught it. And you can imagine what uh, would have happened to the healthcare system had 60 million people caught an influenza and the mortality rate had been, say, 1%. 1% doesn't sound very high, but 1% of 60 million people is 600,000 people. So this would have been um, you know, a, a devastating blow to our healthcare system. And it raised the possibility that we could have places around the country where there would be far more people who would need um, healthcare services and specifically critical care services, things like ventilators, um, than we have available. So, um, so when the Institute of Medicine took this on, um, it really was done in a very urgent setting. Uh, it started its work, the committee started its work in late August and had to be done by uh, September. And I was a reviewer on this report and I remember the review turnaround time was a week. So, um, so this was a, a very quickly put together uh, report, but it made some really important contributions which went on to become incredibly influential in the way that we think about um, pandemic response today. First, it uh, distinguished between the type of care we use every day, which is what we call conventional or usual care, and then contingency care, which happens when the demand for staff equipment, drugs, et cetera, begin to exceed supply, but there are still ways that you can move things around or use alternatives or open up new spaces. This is the surge capacity that we usually think about where you can make adjustments and you can functionally continue to provide pretty good quality care. Maybe not exactly equivalent to normal care, but quite, uh, quite good quality care. Crisis care arises when resources become so depleted that you can clearly no longer provide anything close to functionally um, equivalent care. So crisis care is when you are so swamped that people whom you would obviously normally give, you, give uh, a ventilator, you can't give them a ventilator because you just don't have enough. So if I go to the next slide. Um, there are a number of ethical values that need to be attended to um, throughout this entire uh, spectrum. And I just want to point this out because these values are important in day-to-day -day healthcare as well. Um, but we tend to think about day-to-day -day healthcare as being sort of oriented around the four principles of biomedical ethics, which is a little bit more uh, simplified than um, what we actually need to think through when we are talking about shortage scenarios where we have to do sort of um, military style triage. So issues of fairness and consistency um, become incredibly important when you are making decisions about who can and cannot receive services that normally everyone who needs them would be able to receive. And in particular, I wanna call your attention to the issue of proportionality. Um, in public health, people who do public health ethics are very familiar with the principle of proportionality. But in medical ethics, we don't tend to think about it that much. The principle of proportionality is the idea that you use the least restrictive means to achieve the aim that you're trying to achieve. And in terms of crisis standards of care, what that means is that you don't want to withhold services from one person in order to give them to another unless you 
absolutely have to do that. And what that means from a sort of operational standpoint is that the person making decisions or the team making decisions about who gets access to scarce resources need to have excellent situational awareness across a region. So not just do we have any ventilators in our hospital, but God forbid you should ever withhold a ventilator from a patient at your hospital because you've run out. But there was a ventilator available just six blocks away at a different hospital. So this idea that the people making triage decisions cannot just be the bedside clinicians because the bedside clinicians, number one, have a duty of care to the individual sitting in front of them. So they have a, an obligation to be an advocate for that patient. So this puts them in, a, in an untenable position to cause them also to be the triage team. But number two, the triage team has a responsibility to proportionality to make sure that they know for a fact that if we're withholding something from someone who would normally get it, that is an absolute requirement of the situation and not a choice that we are making. Let me go to the next slide. Um, to just sort of illustrate this. Um, this was from uh, a, a follow-on report um, of the Institute of Medicine um, about crisis standards of care and the importance of recognizing that as a crisis comes and goes, the demand will go, you know, for care will go incredibly high. And if you are prepared, even as the availability of resources goes down, you can stay within either crisis or contingency care. You're uh, sorry, contingency or usual care. What you're trying to do is never go above the crisis line there. So you're trying to avoid or minimize the area and the time during which uh, you are, your supply is far exceeded by uh, the services that you have. So this led to the idea that there is a duty to plan for worst case scenarios. And that duty to plan is not just about knowing what you would do when you get to a worst case scenario. Really the primary purpose of planning for worst case scenarios is to avoid ever having to go into a worst case scenario. So the idea that states around the nation um, and hospital systems are planning for what would we do if we ran out of ventilators, the purpose of that in part is to be prepared if that were to ever happen. But, you know, it looks like that's not going to happen, at least not in this current wave of the pandemic. And yet we are still getting an enormous lot of benefit out of doing that planning because in doing the planning, we're figuring out ways to avoid ever having to go into crisis levels of care. Um, there are a number of sort of guiding principles around crisis standards of care. Um, and the first is what I just mentioned, that the, the core purpose of planning is to learn what you can do to never have to enter crisis standards of care or to spend as little time in crisis level care as possible. Next. Um, there is a joint goal in uh, implementation of crisis standards of care and in planning for crisis standards of care, which is, uh, this is related to point one, which is we want to both avoid the key resource shortages um, that would cause us to go into this and also to minimize the impact of those shortages. And then number three, um, crisis standards of care um, do strive to save the most lives possible. And Kathy will speak more to this in a moment. Um, but the basic um, premise of crisis standards of care is that some people are going to die who might have survived under usual care. So you're not making a choice about whether to go into crisis standards of care. Crisis standards of care come to you whether you like it or not. This is the moment where you know, two or three or five people all need a ventilator and you only have one or two ventilators remaining. So the, it's a forced choice scenario that we're really struggling through here. Um, and number four, um, implementation of crisis standards of care therefore requires both facility specific decisions about allocation of limited resources, but it also absolutely for purposes of equity and fairness requires that crisis standards be 
coordinated across facilities. Because um, as I mentioned before, one of the core responsibilities of implementation of crisis standards of care is to know for sure that you are not implementing crisis care when a hospital nearby has not had to do so yet. So let's go to the next slide and I'm gonna turn this over to Kathy. Thanks, Matt. So Matt and I have both been uh, in conversation with ethicists across the United States who are all about this process of really, how do we allocate uh, critical care resources um, under scarcity? And so I want to spend a few minutes kind of recapping uh, where we've been for the last few weeks, and then hopefully that will launch us into um, some new conversations that uh, I think are um, going to be longer term conversations we'll all be learning from. I will say that as, as Matt was just saying, you know, when we think about ethical decision making in conventional or routine usage times, um, our goals are very much, you know, patient specific and trying to um, minimize adverse outcomes, um, save lives, but also to decrease um, morbidity, long term morbidity. And so what our practices are in terms of making decisions are quite different than uh, what happens uh, under the scenario that we've been in under COVID-19. So the move is very much here to a public health ethics rather than a clinical bedside ethics sort of framework. Um, and under um, the declaration of crisis standards of care or in some states public health emergencies depending on your um, state's uh, sort of efforts to make a declaration about where you are and what therefore is allowable, then uh, scarcity is, is really unavoidable. So just as Matt said, one of the um, sort of early principles I think of ethics in this regard is to do everything you can to be proactive and to prevent the need to allocate or certainly to mitigate that. But if you get to the point of extreme scarcity, then we're in um, a different space in which we're trying to maximize benefits to a population or to a community. So preventive action has not been successful at this point in avoiding uh, choices. And again, we're trying to maximize the number of lives saved perhaps. And the question there of course is, how do we actually do that? So the very detailed work that a lot of us have been involved in nationally and internationally has been coming up with allocation processes. And I want to spend just a few minutes from an ethics perspective, uh, giving you some of the um, primary frameworks or ethical approaches that are being used in um, a great number, of, um, in most cases, I would say majority of the uh, processes that our organizations are creating. So again, maximizing benefits, most of the allocation processes are trying to identify clear clinical criteria by which that decision would be made and are often starting with the likelihood of the person who's in need of the critical care resource to actually survive to discharge or to recovery um, and are utilizing things like the SOFA score, the sequential organ failure assessment score, and other you know, more disease-specific um, prediction tools as well to try to say, what is the reliability and validity of the information we have about certain scoring mechanisms that will actually help us predict the likelihood of survival? So that's kind of a first wave in most plans. And then um, many plans then have a second layer of clinical criteria, which are the um, life years saved or expected life years saved. And there I need to say that um, the most plans that I've looked at are not talking about age here. They're talking about clinical criteria. So for example, if you have uh, two patients of the same age, say they're both 50, and one has had no underlying conditions, health conditions, and then you have another 50 year old who has maybe multiple underlying um, chronic illnesses that would reasonably, and this is a big question, reasonably um, predict that even if they are successfully surviving this hospitalization, the number of uh, life years 
that are um, anticipated for that person would be greatly different than the 50 year old that has no underlying conditions. The skits would be a little bit difficult, I know, and we're, we, I think people have really been challenged to make sure that we're asking the question about how firm of a clinical basis do we have and, and how good are our prediction mechanisms. But these are um, attempts to say, if we have to make difficult choices, what kind of criteria could be applied to every individual who's coming into a healthcare system for care? And can we start with identifying clinical criteria so that we're avoiding any type of categorical exclusion of groups of individuals? Um, that's a, a very strong commitment here. And then um, there would be uh, identification of individuals. Again, we're, we're assuming we're in uh, exhaustion of resources. We have, you know, one ventilator or one CRT or whatever other critical care resource that you want to name available. And we have multiple people who are in need of that resource. And maybe we've been through the clinical criteria and we now still have multiple people at the same level of need. We then might need to identify other approaches for uh, who would actually receive um, that scarce resource. And I understand that most of the processes are, again are built on no categorical exclusion and in fact a very strong emphasis that everyone is eligible for these resources but if we have to make a choice who would rise um, above another person on that, um, that list. And so some of the other approaches that have been looked at and this varies in uh, the plans I've seen nationally one is called the life cycle approach, and this has been used in a number of um, prior pandemic planning um, processes as well. And it says essentially that everybody ought to have an equal opportunity to pass through the various stages of life. So you know, childhood, young adulthood, middle age, and old age. Some work was done during the pandemic influenza um, work um, uh, you know, a decade ago where we actually had the time to ask the public about their input, what their thoughts were on this. And there was support at that time for this kind of a prioritization of um, maybe if someone who was 20 had not had a chance to live through their life and the two, the two individuals we were looking at were um, large blocks of age apart. So not a specific age, but perhaps someone who was later in their life, that it would be reasonable um, from a public perspective we were hearing to say perhaps the 20 year old would be, would be the person who would receive that scarce resource rather than someone who had lived um, much longer in their life. So that's a bit controversial, but that's one approach that's used. Another one that has gotten a lot of attention during the COVID-19 um, pandemic uh, is what's often called um, instrumental value. And so the question that we are thinking about, I think both publicly and healthcare systems, is under what conditions, if any, should healthcare workers or others who are at greater risk of transmission of the virus perhaps be given some um, ability, some prioritization, again, deep into the tiebreaker arena, not not at the clinical, at the top of the process. And so one of the, um, the approaches behind this is this idea that there are individuals who are maybe more essential to responding to the public health emergency, and that indeed, if we're successful in, say, having a respiratory therapist or a nurse or a physician treated and successfully returned to their role, that there would be, if you will, a multiplier effect so that many more people would be saved because that person was available to the front lines again. It does raise um, very important questions to me as an ethicist about what we mean by who is essential. So we could, I think, make a case as well for not just for um, our healthcare professionals who have taken an oath to, um, to be somewhat uh, at risk um, during these times, but also people who are maybe transporting patients into a COVID-19 um, unit or are decontaminating a room, um, anyone with, again, an increased risk of transmission. 
And then we have to extend that question even further though. You know, how about um, all of the employees at our grocery stores who are making it possible for us to have um, essential food or delivery persons who are more at risk. Um, so there are many questions around how far one would extend this concept of um, essential work or instrumental value. And then the last um, approach that is frequently utilized in these processes and often is sort of a last resort would be random allocation. So if we had, again, far too many people, despite having moved through clinical criteria and the other approaches, um, then we might have to simply assign people a random a number and make choices in that way. Um, I'll also say, and then maybe Matt, you, might, you and um, Abby might want to jump in on the last point, but um, there are some approaches that are felt not to be justified at this time. And one of those would be um, first come, first served. And it's interesting because first come, first serve is essentially the way we um, approach decision making about ICU usage in conventional or normal routine times. So, you know, once a person is uh, admitted to the ICU, they're generally not going to be transferred out of the ICU if they still need intensive care. Um, you know, the, there's fiduciary duties to existing patients that seem to take priority over a potential benefits to other patients in routine care. But in a crisis standards of care or public health emergency, things begin to shift again because we're looking at maximizing benefit for a whole community of individuals who are served. And so would you treat um, patients differently uh, who are coming into the hospital than you would those who are already utilizing critical care resources? And probably um, as important or maybe more important is this question about for those who already have decreased access to health care, um, are we privileging people if we utilize first come first serve who are not um, at, at risk as much? So for example, if someone is less likely to be informed about the symptomology for COVID-19 and therefore not reach the hospital as early as others, or someone has um, childcare needs that makes it difficult for them to, to arrive at the healthcare system or transportation issues. For whatever reason, we may be providing prioritization to people who are more able to reach the healthcare setting than others. So first come, first serve is generally not seen as an appropriate um, allocation uh, framework here. There are lots of questions around um, other groups of individuals like children and pregnant women. Um, some of that is virus specific. So um, in uh, the influenza pandemic and work where there were viruses that were more likely to affect children in the National Vaccine Administration programs prioritization during several years, children were actually higher on the receipt of preventive measures like vaccine because they were more at risk than not so much so in the COVID-19 era. So I'm going to stop for a minute to see if Matt would like to jump in on this. Yeah, I, that's a wonderful summary of um, some of the conversations and, and really difficult challenges. Uh, I think um, I've been trying to track our Q&A questions as well, and there are a bunch of things that have come through. Um, Dr. Mort Mower uh, from, uh, from Colorado um, sent in a question, which I interpret as being essentially, um, is there a risk of the perfect becoming the enemy of the good in developing triage protocols like this? And uh, that has certainly been an issue for, for our um, systems here because um, it's a, there are a lot of trade-offs when you're developing protocols. And the reality, of course, is that even the SOFA score, which almost everyone seems to want to use, is also widely recognized, including in a recent National Academies um, report, as being imperfect. Um, and even more than imperfect, it's really, um, you know, potentially the wrong scoring system to use for certain conditions. And so the question becomes, you know, do you try to have a very individualized scoring system for everyone, in which case you run into risks of bias 
um, because individual clinicians will be looking at individual patients. And we know that um, from other studies, there's a lot of opportunity for bias when, when that arises, um, when you've got individuals making sort of nuanced assessments of risks and benefits. Um, or do you try and avoid bias by providing the triage team with just a minimal data set that, for example, does not include information about the patient's race or ethnicity or what their insurance status is or whether they're a VIP donor to the hospital or whether they're a professional athlete, right? Because I think many people think those things should not be included in making decisions um, that are such high stakes decisions. Um, and I just, uh, the other thing I'd like to say that's been a real challenge is once you get very far into this in terms of actually sort of um, operationalizing it and gaming it out, um, you start to run into challenges that are profoundly disturbing, right? So even if you think the only thing that we should care about is saving the most lives, which by the way, I, I don't think that's the right approach, but let's, for simplification, let's say, if you think the only thing that matters is saving the most lives, um, would you take someone off a ventilator to give it to someone else if the person you are removing from the ventilator has a 30% risk of mortality and the person receiving it has a 10% risk of mortality? Um, that is a really, really uncomfortable hypothetical to pose to someone. And again, I, I hope we never would actually get there. But um, looking at the people who are actually in our intensive care units right now, um, across our system, we have a few people who have very high risk of mortality on the order of, you know, 70, 80, 90% risk of mortality right now. Um, it might be, you know, morally understandable and acceptable to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the person, even though they would rather not, their family would like them to keep getting the ventilator, but we have this other person who has a 10% risk of mortality. Would you trade someone with an 80% risk of mortality for someone with a 10% risk? Maybe. But would you trade someone with a 50% risk versus someone with a 40% risk? Would you trade someone with a 10% risk for someone with a 5% risk? And across you know, many hospital systems, the vast majority of patients, including those who are hospitalized and on ventilators, will have a less than 50% risk of dying. So now you're talking about, would you make those kinds of trade-offs? And um, I, I think these questions around first come, first served and lottery are going to become much more difficult if we ever actually had to implement this um, because at a, at a relatively rapid pace, you start talking about trade-offs that are uh, much more challenging than the ones we usually put up as uh, the hypotheticals where you've got you know one person with very advanced cancer and a, and a, and a one-year mortality of 80 percent versus the 35 year old who just has some underlying asthma that that seems relatively easy compared to um, the the scenarios that actually come up when you start using real patient data to oper and trying to say what would happen if we had to operationalize this and we had a shortage of eight or 10 or 12 or 15 ventilators across our system. I totally agree with you, Matt, the, the reality of this. And again, I'm, I am incredibly thankful as we all are that we haven't had to make these kinds of choices yet and I'm hoping we can avoid it. But I do think the, the one of the questions for us all I think is, um, is it wise for us to be in a planning process or we're thinking about these things um, ahead of time and uh, being, you know, careful about what are the, the criteria by which we believe this is the best route. Um, I think uh, one aspect, is, as many of you know, is in addition to coming up with allocation processes, institutions are also putting into place kind of a procedural ethics of um, you know who who is going to actually be available on maybe a triage committee and who would be the triage team members who would actually be charged on any particular day to looking at all of the patients um, 
at the institution for whom that, you know, the, the, they're 10, 10 ventilators too short. Um, and so there are some processes in place that I think are worth thinking carefully about and that um, really the physician or other provider for a particular patient in the ICU uh, will need to be an incredible source of information and a good advocate, of course, for their patient. So for example, you mentioned the question around SOFA scores, the idea of taking a static SOFA score, even if it's, you know, if, if it is utilized is, is a problem in that it needs to be, um, you know, recalculated frequently enough. And you need to know from the critical care physician who's taking care of that patient, you know, for this patient today, is this a patient that's improving or is this a patient that's declining or are they, you know, holding their own? So um, many, many important questions to come. I'm gonna suggest we move to the next slide and the next one just because it will extend our conversation with some other issues and we can go to the next slide as well. Yeah, and if I could, if I could jump in just for one second because I think um, one of the things we wanna emphasize, one of the things I'd like to emphasize at least is that um, even as we hope we never have to implement any of this in terms of entering crisis standards of care, during the planning for crisis standards of care, these other issues are coming up. And so these are the emerging issues that um, we're, you know, we didn't think that we were gonna have to deal with these because of uh, planning for crisis standards of care. But in fact, even though we, we hope we won't enter crisis standards, it looks like we probably won't most places, um, it's, it gives us an opportunity, if you will, to, to think through some of these other issues because um, thinking about the extreme case gives you the chance to think about how do you, how do you avoid that and how do you um, address these issues in advance. Yes, absolutely. So our, you know, there, there is a um, important dialogue happening that has not happened in this depth before um, and hopefully we will um, continue to learn. It's, you know, we're, we're finding out new things about the virus and we're, we're learning new things about implementation of these processes in ways that we feel are reasonable and good, even as the scientific basis for the virus and for what we're, or our treatments are, continues to evolve. So an ever evolving picture. So I'm gonna raise, um, I'm watching our time, but I wanna raise a couple of issues that I think are, um, really just extraordinarily important, and they're both health system issues, but they're societal issues as well. I'm going to make a quick reference to bullet two, but then come back to bullet one. And um, the reason I'm, I'm talking about um, bullet two first is one of the things that happened as um, there were allocation processes being created, and particularly I'll say at a state level, is there began to be some uh, expressed concerns in the form of complaints to the HHS, Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights, from um, individuals or from groups representing those who are living with disabilities. And I think that's been extremely uh, important and has shifted the way some of the allocation processes are being thought about. It's led to changes in the processes, but the complaints, of course, were um, one's concerning about the potential for uh, discrimination, again, against uh, people who are living with disabilities. And so some of the move there has been just um, a powerful uh, rethinking of what are the implications of some of the scoring mechanisms that are used, particularly some disease-specific scoring mechanisms where issues of the functional ability of individuals are sometimes utilized as predictors of how the patient's going to do, and this is usually post-survival from COVID-19. And so the, the emphasis has been to move away from those kinds of indicators um, and to look at things like uh, individualized assessment that Matt mentioned briefly. So really, what are we doing to make sure we're learning as carefully as possible about this particular person and what the implications are for this individual um, and not related to um, what their uh, functional ability will be post COVID-19. Um, the idea of no categorical exclu exclusion, which many of the policies included, but that's been re-emphasized. 
very powerfully. And it does leave us, though, um, with this question of the more we then are attentive to this, we are opening ourselves up for how individual uh, physicians and triage team members will actually make these decisions. So there's a huge wave of learning, I think, to come while we're being um, thoughtful about uh, making sure that there isn't discrimination occurring. And, and some of the states, as you, many of you know, have actually had very explicit language in their earlier guidance that um, did seem to make choices between categories of individuals, for example, by age, that were not um, reasonable and have been changed in those um, states' plans. Now I want to move us back up to um, another just incredibly powerful issue as we began to see the disproportionate effect of the virus in um, particular communities um, in, in the United States. I can speak to you better, but I suspect we could have this conversation globally as well. So um, this, this is um, important in that as we have individuals coming into the healthcare system, whether indeed there are individuals who have underlying medical conditions that are a byproduct of much broader societal issues, um, and also uh, whether there are higher rates of exposure to the virus among um, many individuals. And so kind of moves us again, I'm gonna move us away from the hospital just for a minute to say, there's been a lot of emphasis on uh, social distancing or physical distancing as some prefer to call it in flattening the curve. And that's certainly been powerfully seen globally and nationally as well. Um, and yet um, may not uh, at all take into account some realities for many people in our community. So, you know, not everybody has the luxury of working from home or staying at home. Um, you know, there are many jobs where you can't work remotely. You can't do that if you're, you know, working in a, a grocery or delivery kind of position or a healthcare provider or a farm worker. So that's a bit of a luxury. There are many individuals who are making difficult choices that they need to continue work so that they have income for their family, even though they know it puts them at greater risk and they're traveling on mass transit, whether buses or subways or rail um, and crowded compartments where the transmission is more likely. Um, they also, by the way, don't necessarily, some people don't have a space when they do come home that allows for um, being sort of separated and apart from neighbors, et cetera. And so, and then we think about, of course, our homeless um, uh, individuals who we see in the healthcare system and people who are incarcerated. There are just many elements here that lead to differential um, treatment concerns, social, socioeconomic determinants of health concerns. And because many of these individuals who are uh, uh, experiencing poor outcomes with the disease are also um, people of color, that has been a powerful part of this COVID-19 pandemic that is, is startling and ought to be startling. And so one challenge for us, I think, going forward is you, you just, we should never be ignoring this. And we now have even a brighter um, sort of light sh shown on this and that there must be some ways in which we need to um, mitigate this problem for the future. So this is a huge challenge and I, really dearly hope that those of us working in ethics, but also in healthcare writ large, will take this on seriously and not, um, not miss this moment. Um, there was a really interesting um, New York Times op-ed by Charles Blow some weeks ago. And as he said, again, back to a societal view, staying at home is a privilege. Social distancing is a privilege. And we need to be thoughtful about um, how we're going to address that moving forward. Given our time, I'm going to stop here. And if we have a few minutes for Matt or Abby or for questions. Yeah, just, uh, so 
Um, I think one of the things that um, is worth noting in regard to health disparities is um, these were the, the disproportionate impact of a pandemic on minority communities was um, not only predictable, but it was predicted. Um, so there are a number of people who've done work in health disparities during disasters, and um, it was um, absolutely known that this was a likely event um, in the in the event that there was a pandemic, um, and for all the reasons, Kathy, that you've already mentioned. So one of the questions that had been raised previously and is being raised now is, so what do we do about that? Should we adapt our um, our protocols for triage, for example, in a way to give preference to people who are the victims of underlying structural um, factors that cause them in one way or another to suffer from higher rates of exposure, higher rates of more serious illness, having more comorbidities and so on. And of course, that raises all kinds of concerns um, because it's essentially something like affirmative action, which um, which causes you know people in positions of more privilege to become very defensive about. Um, and I say this as a white man in a position of privilege. Um, so I think you know affirmative action sounds. Um, it really raises a lot of hackles when you're talking about trying to save the most lives. Um, so short of affirmative action, what should we do within our planning process to make sure that we are mitigating and not making worse the underlying structural determinants um, that lead to worse health outcomes for uh, underserved, already underserved communities? Um, we're not probably going to fix all of those issues during a pandemic, but we'd certainly like to make sure that a pandemic does not make an underlying unfairness in our society even worse. And so thinking through how do you ensure that people are supported when they need to stay home? How do you ensure that um, people are treated fairly and not with any level of bias when they arrive for care? How do you ensure that you are very clear about stating the values that underlie your um, systems for making decisions about resource allocation? Um, and how do you acknowledge that um, when we do this kind of work, it is about values. It's not just about science um, and medicine. There's an unavoidable values component um, to, the, to the conversations that we are having. And um, so we, we do want to save the most lives, but we want to save the most lives in ways that will preserve or enhance social cohesion. We want to preserve or enhance trust in our healthcare system. Um, we want at the at the end of all of this to come together as a community and heal and so we don't want to save the most lives in ways that make it harder for us to preserve cohesion and trust and and the capacity to heal um, and that actually affects the ways in which we have these conversations and it should affect the ways in which we talk not just about triage but about other um other uh, questions that are arising. So we didn't get a chance and we won't get a chance today to talk about the ethics of reopening. We won't get a chance today to, to talk about the ethics of personal protective equipment um, and allocation of limited PPE. We won't get a chance to talk about all the ethical issues related to how we are tracking or failing to track the impacts of this um, disease on different communities. Um, there, are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of ways in which this broad question around fairness and health disparities uh, trickle down into many other dilemmas that we're going to face as a, as a community moving forward. Absolutely, and again, we, as, as you may see on uh, slides to come, there are a lot of very specific things coming up clinically, such as should we be uh, treating resuscitation decision making or intubation differently. Um, we we would love to talk about that. I will. I, I'm going to call out one uh, Q question that I see in the Q and A from Shelley, who's asking about um, palliative care. And there's. I wish we had a whole another hour simply to talk about communication during this time, um, the concept of advanced care planning and sort of palliative care issues. Um, I 
I you know, believe that a number of our institutions have had to institute visitor limitation policies that have made it very difficult for family or loved ones to be with patients who are not doing well or be with patients at all. Um, I will say that I'm aware different institutions are handling the idea of having someone with a patient while they're dying differently. Mm -hmm. There are some institutions that have um, allowed someone to come in and it's there. Yes, there's a bit of a risk and there's gowning and all of that, but not unlike um, how uh, healthcare providers are also being escorted in and then escorted out um, and others who have held sort of firm to not allowing someone to be in the hospital um, as a family member with a dying patient, but trying to do as much technology connections as possible. I think that's a, that is one of our tragic choices that we have been making. Um, that I hope one of the possibilities going forward is that we are going to collaborate further and we're going to think further about these kind of difficult um, questions and what kinds of alternatives there might be that are more compassionate. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kathy and Matt and Abby. I think uh, in the interest of time, we're going to have to wrap things up now. I very much appreciate the richness and robustness of the discussion, though. So let me close by putting in another plug for NETAC. Again, uh, we're here to help you not only by providing webinars such as this on timely topics, uh, but also by providing a whole host of other resources that can help you and your institution. Uh, we're not going to have time to get to questions today, but um, we will create a question and answer document and we will post that document uh, on the website within the coming uh, few days. Uh, you can continue to send questions even after this broadcast wraps up by sending those questions to info at NETEC.org. You can also put in requests for technical assistance uh, through the NETEC website. Uh, there are some additional resources you can avail yourself of. Again, these will be posted uh, along with the entire slide deck from today's talk on our NETEC website. So again, uh, I apologize that we have not had time to take questions and answers on the live broadcast, but again, rest assured, we'll attempt to answer uh, all of your questions and we'll share the entire document so you can see uh, your question answered as well as uh, other folks' questions. Again, just a last minute reminder to obtain your CME credit or your CEUs. You've attended the entire webinar and we appreciate the robust attendance today. Uh, complete the post-webinar online evaluation. Once you exit that, uh, a link will appear on the screen. It will give you a five-digit code and uh, you can plug that code in and take it from there. You can do that up to 60 days from uh, the uh, end of this broadcast today. So uh, again, visit us at netech.org, email us at info at netech.org, and I want to thank you very much for uh, listening in today. We had uh, a lot of fun presenting this uh, very important topic and we hope you enjoyed listening to it. This is Ted Seaslack. Thank you. <laughs>